This is a kind of a curious talk. I, I gather the audience is a little bit diminished today because the NELS conference is taking place in Ottawa. Uh, in a way, this is the anti-NELS talk. Uh, I hate talks in which uh, someone tries to present a whole framework very fast. Uh, but unfortunately, that's what I find myself compelled to do today, um, to uh, talk about it. I've sort of reached, a, I think I've reached a place in my work where there is a whole framework in place now, and I want to talk about it so that you can see something of the scope of it. Um, in the past few years, there has been sort of a buzzword in uh, uh, certain circles of linguistics talking about uh, uh, an inquiry called biolinguistics, which is supposed to be about looking at linguistic theory in terms of the place of language in uh, a biological context. Um, and I guess the minimalist program is, of course, the most prominent stream of research in this paradigm, and I think it sort of claims that it's the only uh, stream of research in this paradigm. But um, what I want to try to convince you today is that there is another stream of research in this paradigm, uh, the parallel architecture, which is coming out of my own work. Um, so to be just a bit confrontational, I want to show you how the parallel architecture, combined with two important components of it, conceptual semantics and uh, simpler syntax, actually fulfills the goals of the biolinguistic program better than the minimalist program does. Um, so, how do we start? Well, what do I mean by a parallel architecture? And we can sort of take it in a broad sense, what is a parallel architecture? And then one particular uh, uh, instantiation of it is the parallel architecture in capitals. So, uh, a parallel architecture in general uh, will grow out of the question of what is the best way to allocate the combinatorial capacity of language, um, the generative capacity, the ability to uh, achieve discrete in infinity uh, in such a way that we account for the relation of sound and meaning in human languages. And the answer in mainstream generative grammar, by which I mean whatever Chomsky has been doing from 1955 until the present, uh, uh, and that is the mainstream, no question about it. Uh, the answer there has been an architecture that I call syntactocentric. What does syntactocentric mean? It means that the, there are recursive rules in the syntactic component of grammar, that is the component that deals with noun phrases and verb phrases, and these are the sole source of combinatorial capacity in language. So what you do is you generate syntactic trees, and then you map them on, in one direction into phonology and in the other direction into meaning. So phonology and uh, semantics are conceived of as so-called interpretive components. Um, so uh, there, there is one source of generative, generative capacity in language and its syntax. Um, but if you look at the history of linguistics, since the 1970s, you see that other views of combinatorial capacity have arisen, but nobody's really noticed that they are in competition with this view. So phonology in the 1970s underwent this revolution. Uh, it no longer was phonological structure, just sort of leftover syntactic structure. It came to have its own integral uh, kinds of structure, including segmental syllabic structure, tone tier, metrical grid, uh, uh, international patterns, and so on, which uh, um, really don't, aren't built out of syntactic units. They're quite autonomous units. And furthermore, within it, there are these independent tiers, which are themselves sources of generativity, which are connected by um, rules that you might call correspondence rules among the different components of phonology. So stress rules are now not conceived, conceived of as uh, uh, generating numbers, stress numbers, to be attached to syllables. Rather, they're rules for optimally ma matching syllable structures to a metrical grid. So that's phonology. They're independent sources of generative capacity there. 
in semantics at the same time, if you look at what happened in semantics over the, 90, over the 1970s, there are many, many, many different theories of semantics, all the way from uh, uh, formal semantics, a la Montague and Parti and so on, to cognitive grammar, a la Lanneker and Lakoff and Talmy, with uh, uh, um, uh, Miller and Johnson Laird's procedural semantics mixed in, and all kinds of other theories coming out of artificial intelligence, um, as well as some of my own work. And what, they're entirely different, but what they all take for granted is that there are units of semantics that are not noun phrases and verb phrases. There's things like objects and events and times and uh, those sorts of things, which are not directly represented in syntax. So again, because it's uh, an unlimited system, you need to think about semantics in terms of a generative capacity that is to some degree independent of syntax. Um, now, if you are adopting a syntactocentric approach and you say, well, how does mainstream generative grammar deal with phonology and semantics? Well, the relation between syntax and phonology is a very murky one in the literature, at least from the literature I know. So the idea is that there is some stage called spell out where you turn syntax into phonology but every time somebody actually proposes something for Stella, it's again, it's movement, syntactic movement and deletion. There's nothing about stress rules in Stella. Uh, there's nothing that deals with the genuinely phonological units like intonation contours. Uh, so it seems to me that there, there hasn't really been an account of the relationship between syntax and phonology. Between syntax and semantics, uh, the assumption is that uh, because semantics has to be generated from syntax, that means every distinction of meaning that's involved in meaning structure has to come from syntactic structure. And as people have discovered more and more richness in meaning, that's had to, you've had to build that into syntactic structure so that you can read it off in semantics. And everybody in the mainstream has taken that for granted. Oh, well, here's some more syntactic structure that we need because here are these differences in meaning, ultimately. Uh, and the result has been syntactic structure that is very elaborate, all full of all kinds of uh, functional categories and empty structure and movement. Um, and um, everybody acknowledges that it's there. The only question is, is it a good thing? And uh, among certain circles, they say, oh, this is wonderful. It shows how complex language is. Other circles say, that how can language be that complex? So, <laughs> Uh, but everybody acknowledges that this is the way, this is where you get if you try to account for semantics uh, entirely in terms of syntax, just whether that's your goal or not. Well, the parallel architecture takes a different answer to this basic question, how do we get the combinatoriality of language and how do we relate sound and meaning? The parallel architecture takes these results of uh, phonology and semantics very seriously and says, they have their, their multiple components uh, with combinatorial capacity in language. At least phonology is different, syntax is different, and semantics is different. And maybe inside they have uh, internal structure, internal sources of generativity, as we know in uh, phonology. Um, and then, well, you can't just have these three structures sitting there independently. You have to say how they're linked. So you need a couple of unique components in the grammar called interface components that say, here's how you link constituents of semantics to syntax, how you link constituents of semantics to uh, syntax to phonology, and maybe some direct links between semantics and phonology as well. For example, using stress and intonation alone to indicate focus, uh, which you can do without any syntactic effects whatsoever. Um, so uh, notice, in, I have to do a little terminological uh, exegesis here. In the minimalist program, one talks of the conceptual intentional interface and the sensory motor interface. Um, but these are really levels of syntax. So the conceptual intentional interface is a level of syntax made of NPs and BPs that somehow is supposed to connect to thought. But it's not an interface in my sense. An interface, in my sense, is the relationship between the two independent structures. Okay. 
Okay? Um, so you have to keep that straight. And the interface really means there are two things that are connected. Uh, here's the thing on one side, and we don't worry about what's on the other side, or we can't know about what's on the other side. Um, so finally, we get the idea that the structure of a sentence is not a derivation. It's rather an end tuple of structures, how many different independent structures we need, uh, with linkages established between them by the interface components. So I've uh, given sort of my standard parallel architecture diagram there, where we have formation rules for each component, giving you structures particular to that component, and then interfaces that connect them. Now, a lot of people confronting this classical architecture have said, well, this is really complicated. Wouldn't it be much simpler to just have one generative engine? Uh, so, you know, I think in a review of foundations of language, Colin Phillips and Helen Miles say that. I mean, Norbert Hornstein has said it. Uh, uh, also, we only have one generative engine, and you have three, and all these interfaces and stuff. So obviously, our theory is preferable. Well, yes. Um, but now we go back to uh, a, a paper of Paul Postles in 1969, I think it was published in 1972. 69 or 70 he gave the original paper, called The Best Theory. And Postle wrote this to tout the advantages of generative semantics. He said, we don't have a different semantic component, syntactic component, we just have deep structure, which is semantics and transformation, so it's a better theory. That's the best theory, direct transformational relation between sound and meaning. Well, Chomsky went, uh, 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 post right. <laughs> and he says, no, 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 you don't understand what's a uh, better theory. Um, we can't just talk about formal elegance. We have to talk about the ability of the theory to describe the facts, descriptive adequacy. We have to talk about the ability of the theory to give us an account of acquisition. That's explanatory adequacy. Um, and uh, the interpretive semantic theory, which has separate syntactic and semantic components, is better on that, on those counts. Um, at that point, we didn't know much about semantics being independent. It was still just derived. Uh, but that, that's the argument. And since then, he's added the further uh, constraint that he called beyond explanatory adequacy. We have to explain how the system, the innate system of universal grammar that we use to explain acquisition, how that um, arises from more generative, general cognitive and biological principles. Uh, so now the idea is, can whatever complexity we find in universal grammar, can we explain that uh, on further biological grounds or cognitive grounds? Um, so the argument is formal elegance is nothing if it doesn't explain, if it doesn't give us a purchase on all these other factors. Formal elegance is nice, but we better get the issues right. And in fact, I think uh, an important point is that uh, what's elegant for the brain may not be what's elegant for logic, or what's elegant for biology may not be elegant for uh, logic, for formal logic. Um, the brain arose through you know, a lot of evolutionary accidents, and uh, uh, um, it's a very noisy computational environment, trying to get digital results out of analog machines and you know, things like that. So we don't know what's appropriate for the brain. Now, can we ask which of these architectures, the parallel architecture or the syntax-based one, is more like the rest of the brain? Well, if you look at the visual system, we don't know much about the representations processed by the visual system, but we do know a lot about the brain areas. Uh, um, and there are you know, separate brain areas for dealing with edge detection and detection of motion and detection of where something is as opposed to what it is, uh, for face recognition, uh, possibly for color. Um, and all of these are specialized, and they all have to be talking to each other. So each one has a limited representational capacity, uh, but somehow our to the totality of our visual understanding arises from the interaction of all of them. There's no way you could characterize this as saying one of these is the generative capacity for vision, and the rest of them are derived from it. Rather, it's multiple components talking to each other. Well, that looks like a parallel architecture to me, at least on a qualitative level. Um, 
If you look at music, well, you might say, well, how does music work? Um, well, around uh, oh, well, 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, Fred Lairdall and I started looking at music to try to see whether you could write a generative grammar for it. And we started off the way many people had started off, let's say, can we write a set of rules that generate all and only the uh, correct pieces of music or something like that? Uh, and it became very difficult to determine what's the correct, uh, correct piece of music. In particular, any set of rules we could uh, come up with would derive the same piece of music about 47 different ways, which was not what we had heard. It. And eventually we arrived at a theory of musical grammar that said there are four independent components, grouping structure, metrical structure, time span reduction, and prolongational reduction. You don't have to know what they are. Uh, but four independent generative components, each with a particular structure, and rules that tell you what's the optimal match among them. Well, that looks like a parallel architecture again. And in fact, um, it was completely outrageous back in those days to do grammar that way. Uh, and now, to me, it looks perfectly natural. And in a sense, my theory of language has followed the theory of music. Um, now, an early motivation for the parallel architecture, as I mentioned before, was the, the existence of multiple tiers in phonology. So within each component, uh, uh, within a particular component, it looks like there's just the same structure writ small, uh, also a, a smaller parallel architecture inside phonology. And in semantics, it's become, I think, quite customary to uh, 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 divide the work of semantics into what might be called a propositional tier, who did what to whom, and an information structure tier, what's old information, what's new information, topic, focus, time of organization. And uh, the meaning of a sentence uh, derives from both of those independently, but they're orthogonal to each other. So you can take the same sentence, um, you know, the bear chased the cow, and by stressing it differently, change the information structure keeping the propositional structure constant. So that looks like independent tiers within semantics as well. Um, so it looks like, um, again, a, 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 um, a parallel architecture within the semantic component. Finally, uh, think about the relation of language to the visual system. Uh, and this was a question posed by my dear old friend, uh, John McNamara of McGill. Uh, who I miss a lot when I come to Montreal. Uh, he said, how can we talk about what we see? How is that possible? And his conclusion was, there has to be a way to translate visual representations into linguistic ones. In other words, another interface between representations. You're not going to derive linguistic representations by an algorithm from visual ones or vice versa. You need an independent generative engine for vision and an interface between visual and linguistic representation. So again, it looks like we need some element of parallelism. So what we come up with is that um, if you think about the, the interior of the visual system and the way the brain seems to be organized generally, if you think about the structure of other cognitive capacities like vision and music, if you think about the interior structure of linguistic components such as phonology and semantics, and if you think about the relation of language to vision, every time you come up with parallel architectures. So it should start feeling natural to do it for the language capacity as a whole, uh, even though we're not used to thinking that way. And of course, um, there are many frameworks around that employ some degree of parallelism. So LFG, lexical functional grammar, is well known for saying, oh no, constituent structure is not all there is to syntax. There's also a uh, functional structure, which is about grammatical relations. Uh, Jerry Sadock's auto lexical syntax says, oh, it's not a single unified syntactic uh, component. There's a separate component for morphology and a separate one for phrasal syntax, and they talk to each other. Uh, Roland reference grammar has the same tiers in syntax and also um, uh, propositional and information structure in semantics and in interfaces going every which way among them. Uh, and the granddaddy of them all, believe it or not, is Sidney Lamb's stratificational grammar back from the 60s, 
where he says the whole language capacity is a series of levels, each one with its own computational integrity, and then interfaces sort of linking them up in kind of a ladder, all the way from phonetics to meaning. Um, that seemed totally crazy in 1966, but it's not so crazy now. Um, so um, there, it's not as though parallel architectures are unattested in linguistic theory. Uh, the mainstream has, I think, ignored them altogether as a possibility because of this assumption that syntax has to be the generative engine. Um, a second basic issue that I just want to touch on briefly is what are the formal operations like that are used to build linguistic structure? And what we know from the mainstream, what we learn all the time, is well, you generate them algorithmically. So in the old days, you would sort of start with S, and you expand that into NP and VP, and then you expand the NP, and finally you put the words in the bottom. And then you start moving things around in the tree, and you get surface structure. Um, in tree adjoining grammar, oh, in, well, in the minimalist program, instead you start with words and you stick them together and you stick another word on until you get the tree. So you get some tree, you start moving things around, you add some more things on. It's still this incremental algorithmic derivation of sentences. And then, of course, you algorithmically derive the phonology and semantics if you know how to do it. Um, tree adjoining grammar also takes pieces of tree, attaches them together, and words come with pieces of tree attached to them, and you're clipping things together. So that's another algorithmic derivation of sort of theory. Um, in the parallel architecture, because of the nature of interface constraints, you can't do it derivationally. So an interface constraint only says these two pieces of structure can be linked to each other. But you can't get this one from this one, and you can't get this one from this one. It can't be done in a logical order. It's sort of a simultaneous constraint on the two structures. So you need a constraint-based conception of uh, at least part of the derivation. Um, and in fact, most of the constraint-based theories, most of the all, well, all the parallel theories and other constraint-based theories, also have constraint-based generation. So you don't sort of start here at some point in the tree, either at the top or the bottom, work your way up. You just say, here's a tree. Here are the constraints it has to satisfy. If it satisfies them, it's well formed. End of story. Okay, there's no logical order to these things. Um, and that's true in uh, LFG and all in reference grammar and all the lexical syntax and HPSG. All, practically all of the frameworks other than the mainstream and tree adjoining grammar. Um, so we end up with no notion of logical sequence of a derivation. Rather, every, you can think of um, the various structures being licensed by component internal constraints and then interface constraints, it's not all at once. What this means is that there's no derivation from deep structure to surface structure or deep structure of logical form or anything like that. You just have these levels. Um, so now, what so far I've been talking about parallel architectures in general, um, and the issue for any parallel architecture then is what are the actual representational formats? What are the generative systems? And, uh, what are the linkages between them? How are they constrained, and so forth? And each of the theories I mentioned has a different answer to this, although there's you know some convergence. So let's go to the parallel architecture. That is my version of it. And um, I think it emerged that the, the leading question that motivates this way of looking at, at language, for me, is actually psycholinguistic. Um, so it's a question, is what do you have to store in memory? And what can you build online? Um, and it's interesting because, uh, I'm sorry, Anna Maria de Schulo isn't here because her a uh, book with Edwin Williams on the definition of word raised that question. I think it was on page one, and they said, actually, the, the question of what's listed is of no interest to the grammarian. Um, they were interested in the grammatical definition of what's a word versus what's a phrase, and that's an important grammatical question for the theory of grammar. And what they were, what made so what struck me is that's really orthogonal to the question of what you store in memory. But I'm going to take the question of what you store in memory very seriously because it leads to a whole different conception of the language. 
kind of started. So um, the traditional story is the lexicon, what you store in memory, is the words or the morphemes, whatever you agree on. Uh, and then there's something else, there's the grammar. So you store the words and you store the grammar. And that's standard from traditional memory of a grammar and a dictionary, right? Um, and that's taken over completely into generative grammar. It's taken over completely into formal logic. Um, it's just everywhere. But let's ask what a word is. Well, a word, everybody agrees, I think, you know, even back to Saussure, a word is a triple of phonological structure, a piece of phonology, you pronounce it like this, uh, a piece of meaning, here's what it means, whatever meanings, of whatever you take meanings to be, and some syntactic features like part of speech and grammatical gender and, you know, all the usual, you know, the mainstream calls them five features, formal features. Um, now, as I said, in a syntactocentric derivation, what you do then is you take this triple, you put it in a syntactic tree. The only part that's meaningful to the syntactic derivation are the syntactic features. The rest is invisible. So you're toting around all this invisible information till you get to PF, where you read off the phonological part, now the syntactic information is irrelevant, the meaning is irrelevant. And you, another part of the derivation takes you to LF, where the meaning is relevant and all the other stuff is irrelevant. Um, so you are um, inserting these words and they're really doing no work. All the work is being done by the rule. Well, if you think of the parallel architecture and you say, well, one of the things we need to do is to match phonological to syntactic to semantic structures, what better thing than a word? A word says, I'm stored in memory, I'm an association, long-term memory association of a piece of phonology, a piece of meaning, a piece of syntax. So when you hear this piece of phonology, you're licensed to say, oh, they're conveying this meaning. Or if there's a meaning you want to convey, the lexicon is saying, this is what you want to say, this is what you want to express, here's how you pronounce it. Okay? So it's an interface rule. It's not a separate component, it's part of the interface component. Now, if you start thinking about it this way, is you can't say, well, there's a point. Well, at what point do you insert lexical items? There's no point where you insert them. Any place, they don't go into one structure, into syntax. They go into all three at once. So you can think of the word, if you like, as being inserted into three positions at the same time, right? Phonology, syntax, and semantics, and it's providing the link among them. Uh, or, you can think of the word, if you don't want to think in terms of insertion, you can think of licensing. If you have three structures sitting there, the existence of a word in the lexicon says, this combination of linking is OK. That's a possible way you can do it in this language. Another way you can think of it is in terms of processing, which I just sort of suggested. So if you hear this noise, then the processor says to the lexicon, any of you guys sound like this? and some of them raise their hand, right? And you get the phonology, and once you get the phonology, it says, oh, you can also carry along this meaning, and then you're started with the part, and you can carry along this part of speech, and this, you know, these, you know, let's say I'm a verb, and I require an object, then you can expect an object to become. So that's the syntactic part. So by hearing the phonology, it's allowing you to construct syntactic and semantic structure to go with it. In production, just the other way around. You say, ooh, this is what I, what I want to say. Any of you guys in there mean this? And some of them raise their hands, and they provide potential candidates for things you're going to pronounce. So, and that's actually very much in line with what the people who work on lexical access and psycholinguistics think about the lexicon. So that's a very, I think it's a very productive way to think about lexical items. Now, as I mentioned, lexical items will include contextual restrictions. So they'll have things like, well, uh, well-known syntactic contextual restrictions. Am I transitive? Do I take you know, an indirect object? Do I, uh, 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 what's my grammatical gender? So I have, will have to agree with something else, and so on. Um, and the semantic contextual restrictions are well-known selectional restrictions. So this verb requires an object. And this verb requires objects that are means of matrices, diagonalized, you know, whatever the peculiar 
uh, semantics are of the uh, of, of words. Fine. So that's words. But we also notice there are very odd kinds of words lying around in the lexicon. So in English, um, you know, there are a few dozen words that have phonology and semantics, but no syntax. Things like hello and ouch and yikes and upsy daisy and alexazan and wow, things like that, which are utterances all on their own. And they do not fit in the syntactic structures, except in things like direct quotes, where you know you can put a phrase of French into an English sentence, or vice versa. Right? Uh, so there are no syntactic constraints on direct quotes. So these things have no syntactic features whatsoever, uh, but they count as utterances. You can list them in the lexicon and say, well, they insert licitly on phonology and semantics, and there's no syntactic structure you can associate with them. End of story. Uh, they're a little problematic if you say, well, the only way words can get into sentences is by being inserted in this syntactic tree. What's a syntactic tree for ouch? Who knows? Uh, it's kind of pointless to say that it's syntactic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Out bar. Out bar. Oh, it's an out bar. It's so, <laughs> it's so unusual, right? Out bar, right? Um, and of course, we have words in the language that have phonological and syntactic properties, but no semantics, things like pleonastic it and the do support and uh, the of, the you know, noun, noun of noun phrase, you know, the, the president of Iraq or something like that. And complementizers are basically meaningless. So there are lexical items that have that are defective in missing some of the parts. Um, in addition, if, we, if we're thinking in terms of what we have to store, where well, we have to store lexical items that are larger than a word, and we start with thousands and thousands and thousands of idioms in the language, um, which I, I think there are as many idioms as there are adjectives in English, for sure. Um, and uh, in addition, there are all these fixed expressions, cliches that mean pretty much what they're supposed to mean, but you know them as fixed expressions, like weapons of mass destruction, right? It has to be there in, as a unit. It might say, well, that's not a lexical item. You know, that's in the phrasing mom. Say, what's the difference? You know, it's made of phonology, syntax, and semantics. It's got all the same stuff in it as dog, except it has some syntactic structure. So if you're going to say there's a phrasicon, you, know, you can tell whether it's in the lexicon or the phrasicon because it has phrase structure. It still has to get into sentences in the very same way. Uh, so the consequence is that lexical items can't all be uh, syntactic atoms. You can't say, OK, we build our structure down to N, V, determine, and so forth, and then we insert words. Because you have to insert kick the bucket as a unit. Uh, you can't just insert kick and then hope it's going to be followed by bucket when it means die. Um, people have said you can, but it means you also have to say when you insert bucket after kick, it doesn't mean anything because kick has used up the meaning. So every, and the has to be in there meaning nothing. So you actually have to, in every, if you want to say it's one word at a time, each word has to encode the idiom individually as though it's this phenomenal accident that the things all fit together. Each of them mentioning the other words in the idiom. So it's hugely redundant. Redundancy isn't bad, but this is not a solution in order to say lexical insertion. The same goes for merge. If kick the bucket comes with its own syntactic structure, in the lexicon, then you can't have gotten it by merging from syntactic atoms unless you say, well, there's also merge in the lexicon. What is that? It, you know, you can sort of, it's a rhetorical ploy, but it really doesn't pay off. Um, so, but if you think of these as just pieces of structure stored in the lexicon that uh, uh, enable you to link syntax and semantics, and phonology. So if you hear kick the bucket, you say, oh, that's a piece of syntax. It's a verb phrase that means die. And the story is very simple. Uh, this is basically HPSG's solution for idiom. Um, it also says, uh, uh, this position also says that uh, the lexicon can't be non-redundant. Uh, there is this myth 
that the lexicon is a non-redundant list of exceptions and you take all the rules and put them in the grammar. Nobody has really ever shown how you can do that. Um, and in fact, um, you certainly can't do it for weapons of mass destruction, because weapons of mass destruction are made of words you know, so they're redundant. You take out all the words, what's left? There's nothing left to list as that uh, uh, cliché. Um, so it's very difficult to think of the lexicon as not redundant once you confront these things. I think in terms of other issues in morphology as well, but we'll set those aside. Um, and you might say, well, that's terrible that the lexicon is redundant. But is the brain redundant, full of redundancy? I think so. Uh, that's my guess, that the brain the, the brain works better when things are redundant than when they're not redundant. So, uh, um, because it's a very noisy environment. So, uh, again, that's a guess, but it looks to me like this is a characteristic of brain intelligence, that you want things to be as redundant as possible if you can help it. Now, this view of this question of what you store also leads us to think about things like regular affixes. So, the English regular plural says, Oh, I'm pronounced the or so or os, depending on my context. I mean plural. I attach the nouns. Uh, and uh, uh, um, I'm a plural. I'm an affix on a noun. And I attach the count, meanings of count nouns to make them into aggregates or something. So this is really starts sounding a lot like a transitive verb, which says, I have this meaning. I have an argument. I attach noun phrases to myself. And here's how you pronounce it. So it, one can assimilate regular affixation to normal you know, processes of phrasal combination, only it's just inside a word. This is where I use the, the Shiloh and Williams uh, 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 distinction between words and phrases. Here you say, here's something that's not a word. It's smaller than a word. It's listed in the lexicon. It combines with words the same way that uh, uh, other words combined with phrases. And the story is very simple. Um, it's totally productive except when it's blocked by irregulars and so on. Um, and of course, irregular plurals have to be listed. Um, and you have to learn them one by one. Um, and they're semantically and syntactically composite. So something like children is syntactically a plural noun, two elements. And semantically, it's a it's composite. It's a plural of whatever child means. But phonologically, it's unitary. So it's just the flip side of idioms, okay? Where there's semantically unitary, but syntactically and phonologically composite. So we can think of irregulars as morphological idioms, if you like. Um, I just want to mention a couple of other unusual regular morphemes in the lexicon. So things like English expletive in fixation, like manufucking factor, um, where the literature has mostly talked about the phonological conditions for inserting it, but they haven't asked how it's listed in the lexicon. Okay? How how that's known. Right? Well, you'd say it has a piece of phonology with contextual conditions that are prosodic. Um, it has a meaning. Um, and it doesn't have much of a syntactic structure, except that I'm attached to some word or another. That's about all there is to it. But again, it looks very much like a productive lexical item, except it has this funny phonological shape. Reduplication also. Uh, reduplication, again, the phonological literature is concentrated on how you know what to reduplicate. But every reduplicative morphine has a meaning. It attaches to a certain class of words. So if it means plural, it attaches to nouns. Um, so and it looks like um, the range of meanings for reduplicative morphemes is about the same as for any other kind of affixation. You know, you get plural, you get past, you get diminutive, you get you know all of those things. Um, so you can state this as a lexical item that has a meaning. It's a syntactic affix. And phonologically, it has this weird phonological form that says, copy something in my vicinity. So it's kind of has a binding relation in phonology. Uh, so that's also listed in the lexicon with the proviso that we need this funny thing to enter the phonology. 
Now I should say, so that I should say this is a little different from the LFG and HPSG view of the lexicon because they see things like uh, verbal inflection as lexical rules. So to form a passive verb, there's a lexical rule that changes the argument structure of a verb in the lexicon. Uh, I don't want to do that because the lexicon is supposed to be what you store on one hand. On the other hand, if something is totally productive, you don't want to store all the forms of all these words in the lexicon. You want to be able to build them on the fly. That means you need something in the lexicon that enables you to build things on the fly, not in the lexicon, right, as you're hearing the sentence. Uh, so that means that the passive should be treated as a lexical item that uh, affects argument structure, not within the lexicon, but in the composition of a sentence. So that's a little different. Um, also, the lexicon contains constructions, as in construction grammar. These are pieces of syntax that carry idiomatic meanings, uh, with or without overt morphemes and markets. So I've given a list of something, some that are uh, basically verb phrases, like joke your way into the meet meeting, where joke doesn't take any of those kinds of arguments. Rather, the construction, uh, verb one's way, prepositional phrase means go to along that prepositional phrase by or while doing the verb. Okay, so the argument structure of this verb phrase is completely screwed up by the construction. Um, and various others like that. And then there's some, so I've given you four that are verb phrases, and then there's some that have completely weird syntax, uh, what Peter Kultover is called syntactic nuts. So things like the more you eat, the fatter you get. This thing at the beginning of the clause, conjoined with or not conjoined, uh, just jammed against another clause of the same form, is totally unprecedented uh, in English anywhere else. Or this construction, one more beer and I'm leaving, which means if something significant happens with respect to one more beer, I'm leaving, um, and the semantics is totally unspecified. And now we have a noun phrase conjoined with a sentence. That's again totally weird. A uh, student after student, day by day, uh, a face to face, that whole set of constructions um, has very weird syntax. And finally, how about some lunch? Uh, the how about XP construction just gives you an utterance one off that bears no relationship to anything else we know syntactic. Um, so, construction is a linking between a syntactic complex and a meaning. Um, and there may be some phonology like way in the way construction. Um, and it integrates with the sentence in the same way as idioms do, uh, just as more variables in it. So the notion of composition with these constructions is perfectly straightforward in a constraint-based parallel, uh, parallel architecture. This is the way construction grammar does it, more or less. And HBSB is leading that way. Um, finally, we ask, well, we have all of these lexical items that have pieces of phrase structure in them, like BPs, what about just a lexical item that's just a piece of syntax? It says a verb phrase dominating a verb and a noun phrase. It just has all variables in it. We could list that. As long as we can list BP dominating kick the bucket, we ought to be able to just list BP and noun and <laughs> verb and noun phrase. So phrase structure rules fall out of this very same formalism. They look like lexical items too. Now is when you're starting to get nervous, probably, if you learn linguistics the normal way. Um, um, because um, we, we're now saying there no, there's no principal distinction between words and rules of grammar. There's just this continuum of how many variables something has in it, how much phonology is listed, how specific the meaning is, how productive it is, and so on. With words at one end that's very idiosyncratic, and phrase structure rules, and syllable structure rules, and things like that, at the other end of the continuum with all of this other stuff in between. Now this, actually, as you say, um, this conclusion has been arrived at independently by HPSG, by cognitive grammar. Lanneker stresses this in his 1987 book. Uh, construction grammar, uh, Adele Goldberg stresses this in her books, and so on. It's not peculiar to me, okay? It's around, it's in the air. Uh, and mainstream grammar has 
bypass this issue by never having anything substantive to say about any of the constructions, as far as I know. Nothing. There, you know, in 40 years, there is no period of idiom. And in the 15 years that I've been working on construction, 20 years I've been working on construction, there's nothing about the way construction. People talk about the result of it, but none of the other more uh, 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 archaic construction, a little more elaborate construction. So um, it's, it's kind of fun. It, again, the parallel architecture seems to be capturing something going on in language that the mainstream theory doesn't. Um, it's interesting, recently, in the past 10 years, every once in a while, you catch Chomsky saying, actually, maybe it's interesting, maybe there's only one rule of grammar, and that's merge. Stick two pieces together, and the rest is in the lexicon. Nobody, everybody says, oh, isn't that interesting? Well, how do you do it? Uh, and nobody really tries to work it out except for little particular things. You know, this language differs from that language because it has this functional category or something like that. But there's no comprehensive theory of it. In fact, in the parallel architecture, this is exactly right. The only rule of grammar, procedural rule, is put things together by unification. All the pieces are in the lexicon. Unification is not stick two pieces together under a tree. It's stick two pieces together such that their similar parts coincide and it preserves the parts that are different. So you take this and this, put them together, you get that. Um, and this, uh, so you might say, is that different from merge? Well, it is. You can derive merge from this, from unification. Merge is take two elements and take a piece of structure and unify the three of them you get the structure. Um, unification se seems to be appropriate for other things in the mind. So if you think about the visual system um, deriving our sensation of depth, there are, I don't know, six or eight different systems that are, that are involved in calculating depth, um, lens accommodation, eye convergence, binocular disparity, parallax, cognitive stuff about how big things should be, and I think there are one or two others. You cannot put those together with merge to get this is how far away it is. You can get it by unification. Or for a simple case, think about singing, where what are you doing? You're taking a musical line and you're sticking words on it. That's not building a tree that says word and note, and somehow you build a bigger tree that is either a word or a note or no trace or something like that. Rather, it's taking their common structure, usually their common metrical structure, assimilating, assimilating, unifying them, and assimilating the metrical structure to that of the music, the timing to that of the music, not to the words. Um, that's a unification process, not a merge process. So it looks like unification is of use elsewhere in cognition. I can't imagine merge being of use anywhere else in cognition. Well, I'm sure there are some, but nobody's really given us any. Um, so, what we're getting is, here's this theory of the lexicon. Yeah, question? Uh, can you say something, can you say something about how do you get order with unification? Order in communication? Order with unification. You order order with, unification. with unification. Yeah, linear order is just one of your primitives of combination. That's all. How do you get order with merge? Now that you know the talk of merge is you're just building a tree, and then there's something about the hierarchy that tells you linear order. Somewhere you have to say there's linear order. Sure. Um, and unification can say that's a further constraint that applies. Let's say the verb has to precede the noun phrase, um, or something like that. If you don't have that constraint, you can get free phrase order without changing the tree at all. Um, Okay, so what we have is this rather general theory of what you store of the lexicon. And in fact, I think the minimalist program has no theory of the lexicon whatsoever. You know, the theory of syntax gets gradually denuded and things are put into the lexicon and we don't know what the lexicon looks like anymore. It's just a list of exceptions. And maybe some functional categories that serve the purpose that parameters used to serve. Okay. Uh, how are we doing on time? Oh, God, I've already talked about it. Um, let me tell you very briefly about the theory of semantics that goes with this. 
if I can. Um, there's this huge tension, I think. No, I don't um, Conceptual semantics, the way I do semantics, is growing out of an attempt to build a theory of meaning that's compatible with generative grammar, in that it's totally mentalistic. So the theories of semantics that we get from formal semantics, from philosophy of language, they always think of meaning as somewhere else. Language isn't in the head, meaning isn't in the head. If people misuse meaning, it's because they haven't grasped the meaning. But they don't ask what's going on in your head when you're understanding a sentence, drawing inferences, reasoning, connecting your perception to what you say, and so on. So the conceptual semantics is an attempt to do that. Um, and it's based on the, I think, observation, I think it's an observation, that many aspects of our understanding of the world don't have anything to do with language. So for example, our theory of naive physics, how objects are situated in the world and act on each other and so forth, is really pre-linguistic, um, and it's found in babies and apes as well as people. Uh, so you don't need language to understand the physical world. Um, that means that uh, this aspect of understanding provides an innate basis for the concepts uh, that we talk about when we're talking about space. So uh, it provides a, if you like, a pre-adaptation for the development of language uh, in, in evolutionary time. That's, I take that to be explanatory. Um, and in fact, in the, if I understand Chomsky properly, he seems to be saying that, and certainly the syntactocentric architecture commits you to this, the same combinatorial thought requires combinatorial language. So it says, language evolved so we could think. Well, if you look at the literature on priming behavior, priming social understanding and physical understanding, they damn well think. Babies damn well think. All of the literature on acquisition these days is, what are the things babies know about the world before they can learn to talk? And how does that provide them the basis for, um, for learning language, okay? So the idea that thinking is parasitic on language is just so backwards. I'll let you provide the prefix on that. Um, um, and in fact, um, the, the approach of conceptual semantics is possible exactly because we have the parallel architecture. We could say, there is this system of thought. There is a system of language that expresses it. And uh, this can exist without that. And that's, that comes out very nicely. Um, I want to say, I'll go very quickly through this, that um, in fact, there are many, there's a great deal of articulation inside of meaning. So um, I think there are two major elements that I call spatial structure and conceptual structure. Where spatial structure is sort of geometric, topological, um, it's, it's not exactly visual images because it has to be capable of representing an object independent of where you're seeing it from, so that you can deal with object constants in perception. It has to be able to schematize objects so that you can recognize an action independent of who is performing it. So uh, um, you can understand the action of sitting whether it's me or somebody else doing it, it doesn't depend on my face and my height and my coloring and so on. Um, so it has to be more abstract than visual imagery. Um, and in addition, it's something that you have to be able to use also for understanding things by touch. So I can pick this up without looking at it because I have some idea of its shape and its position. Um, and I would be surprised if my hand went here and it weren't here and went right through it. So there have to be communication between the haptic system, the understanding of the body position, which is proprioception, and vision in order to coordinate all those things. And I take that as a problem of spatial structures. And you might say, well, is that enough to do meaning? And the answer is no, because there are all these things that look more sort of algebraic, like the type token distinction, which doesn't depend on what things look like, taxonomic relations, this is an instance of that category, temporal relations, um, 
causal relations might be sometimes in spatial structure, I don't know. Uh, modal notions, this is hypothetical, this is non specific, <coughs> this is in the future, it's fictional. Social notions, which I uh, are all over the place in primate cognition, dominance, kinship, group membership, uh, obligations, who owes what, reciprocity, and so forth. A uh, theory of mind notions like believing and imagining and intending, uh, and uh, one I forgot to put in quantification, of course, can be conveyed spatially. So you end up with an architecture like uh, what I have at the bottom of page seven, where conceptual structures most directly link to language, but spatial structures in the architecture too, and it connects through more interfaces to all the other all these perceptual systems. Um, so language proper is really phonology and syntax, and the interfaces to conceptual structure, and then the rest is cognition, central cognition. This is sort of like um, Pavio's old dual coding hypothesis or Coslin's idea that there's propositional and imagistic reasoning. Uh, in a way. Okay, I'll skip all the details of um, conceptual semantics on page eight uh, and go to what does this lead for syntax. Um, if you have an independent semantic component that is representing the meaning, and syntax doesn't have to represent all the meaning. What do you need syntax for at all? And um, it looks like you need it as part of an interface system. You have to map from sound the meaning. And the word meanings tell you chunks of the word. If you hear a string of words, that gives you chunks of meaning. But now you have to know how to connect them. So you have to know who's the actor and who's the patient. Um, and syntax is a way of uh, making manifests the semantic relation among the words through word order, through inflection, basically, through constituent structure that then gets played out in terms of prosody. Um, and so syntax is not um, a complete mapping of meaning into sound. It's a pretty good partial mapping. But there are many aspects of meaning that are not supported by syntax at all. So implicature. So my wife says to me, are you going to be going near a mailbox? <coughs> that isn't what she wants to know. She wants to know if I'll mail a letter for it, right? The usual pricing sort of thing. Uh, ellipsis. So um, this is an example from a popular song of the 1930s. It seems we stood and talked like this before. We looked at each other in the same way then, but I can't remember where or when. Now, standard approach would say where or when, followed by a whole bunch of syntax that gets erased. But I dare you to find syntax that copies those preceding two sentences, not conjoined, and still is a grammatical indirect question. Okay? It can't be done. Or cases where it's totally pragmatic. So somebody's about to jump off a building and you say, don't. And there's no syntax. Don't jump off that building that gets erased. It's just the meaning is there. And it's built from the context, not from the syntax. Um, and coercion like that, you know, the famous number, famous example of the waitress saying the ham sandwich uh, over in the corner wants more coffee. Ham sandwich is not felicitous between ham sandwich and person. Um, it's not listed twice in the lexicon. There's a general productive process of reinterpretation. You don't need syntax to do that. In fact, I wrote a paper about 15 years ago called Madame Tussaud Meets the Binding Theory, uh, which is reproduced in modernized form in the book with Kalkover, a simpler syntax, that says you can't do it in a syntax. There's no way to make it work. Um, so there's all kinds of things in meaning that are not present in syntax. Um, but it, so our theory of simpler syntax is an attempt to cut syntactic structure down to the bare minimum, does this sound to me, the bare minimum, to accomplish the mapping between sound and meaning, uh, but a different conception of minimum, not minimum rules, but minimum structure. So we end up with very flat structures, noun phrases, just two layers deep noun phrase and everything hanging from it, verb phrases, two layers deep verb phrase and verb and everything else. Uh, sentences, three layers deep, sentence, verb, phrase, verb. Uh, 
and everything else is laid out, no binary branching, multiple branching all over the place. Uh, we looked at the arguments for the simplicity of binary branching, and they're all bogus. Uh, I'm sorry to say. Uh, they're based on simplicity. Well, you're playing off two kinds of simplicity, number of nodes versus number of branching. Number of nodes is just as good a measure of simplicity. Um, and it makes processing easier. You just have to find less constituent structure. Um, so um, we end up with um, uh, and, of course, one of the alleged advan advantages for binary branching is now you don't need linear order in order to do things like an average. You can do it all in terms of dominance. Well, you get linear order for free. That's there in the phenology. It's that you can't avoid having linear order. If you can avoid having hierarchy. That's a price of processing. Right? You have to construct that when you're processing. So it's actually better to use linear order. Uh, the argument that now we can do without linear order, and that simplifies the definition of C command because we can think, you know, well, the price is having all the structure that you have to process and infer. Uh, so we think that using linear order is actually an advantage. Um, we get rid of we we get rid of all empty nodes except traces of WH movement, but no traces in path, no traces in subject auxiliary inversion. In fact, we get rid of all movement, we think, at least we try, through a variety of different devices, almost all of which are in the literature somewhere or another, usually in the EPSG or LFG or construction grammar. Um, and so we only end up, uh, oh, and binding and control our operations mostly over conceptual structure, over meaning, uh, not over syntax. Um, and you need a meaning anyway in order to drive inference. So to know John tried to leave, John is leaving, you need that for inference. <coughs> so you have to have it in conceptual structure. Why have it in syntax as well? You don't need it there. So we can the, the syntactic structure John tried to leave is John tried to leave. Okay, no pro. Um, the one thing we turned out to be that kind of startled us uh, and we took it on grudgingly, uh, was a very limited grammatical function tier, which is a real stripped down version of F structure in LFG. And it turns out you need that to do passive and raising and certain things with reflexives. Um, so I've given you on page 11 how John seems to like scotch, for example. Um, so the meaning is just what you expect. Meaning is uh, seen as an operator over John Lang Scotch. Okay? And then the subscripts are showing you what uh, constituents map to what constituents. And I also use vertical lines for some of the mappings. What you see is in the end, the syntactic structure has no subject for to like Scotch. Okay? Uh, the bottom line is now not at the, it, John seems to like Scotch, it's no longer in syntax, it's in phonology, but not in syntax. Uh, all you have in syntax is NPV to VNP. Um, and between the semantics and the syntax is this grammatical function tier. And what you see in the grammatical function tier, the trick that gives us raising, is the subscript 3 on the grammatical function tier for the subject of the main clause, connecting to the three in the grammatical function tier for the subordinate clause. So there's a binding in grammatical functions that gives us the effect of raising. So you trace from John in semantics to grammatical function three in the subordinate clause to grammatical function sub three in the main clause to the subject of the sentence to the phonology John. Okay, so that's how, and it's all done by um, constraints, not by derivation. So that's the effect of raising. If we didn't have that tier, I would love it, but we couldn't figure out how to do without it. We took heart from the fact that every theory of syntax has something like it. So LFG has F structure. Relational grammar has relational grammar. That's all the hypermetric functions. Uh, HPSG has the complement hierarchy. Government binding theory has abstract case, which is doing that work. Right? Things move because they need abstract case. That's and where do they move? They move to the next clause. So that's the bind corresponds to our binding <coughs> functions. 
uh, where in our story, this grammatical function uh, three in the subordinate clause can't be satisfied in syntax because of that's a panto verb phrase without a subject, so it has to be realized upstairs. So, um, what does this have to do with violin? So, this is a big piece of machinery. I think it's a simpler version of syntax than the one everybody has grown to know and be afraid of. Um, um, and as I've said already, language processing now is assembling pieces out of the lexicon into working memory, and it turns out to give a very nice picture processing, make, uh, it conforms pretty well with the literature. I have a piece in uh, brain research of all places about the processing model and how compared with other ones on the market. Um, so what do we end up with? Well, we have conceptual structure and spatial structure in apes. So we don't need that as part of the language, per se. That's an advantage. Um, we could talk about proto-language. Uh, I know better not get into evolution now. Um, but the fact is that syntax is an add-on, that we could have something that functioned like a proto-language system with just phonology and semantics. So, um, and we see it in today's pigeons, for example, and probably showing up in agromatic aphasia and various other configurations. Uh, just phonology and semantics and the rest, the sem semantic relations are done basically by pragmatics. Um, so syntax is the latecomer in evolution rather than the thing that came first and somehow language popped into being. So this is a different beyond explanatory adequacy story than Chomsky's. So what I've tried to show you is that this theory, the parallel architecture combined with and simpler syntax actually instantiates the biolinguistic program better than the minimalist program. It doesn't have to give all the same promises of being perfect, but actually in the details it, 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 uh, is much better, I think. Um, and in particular, it integrates linguistics, I think, quite fully with cognitive science in a way that's impossible under the minimalist program. The challenges, of course, are how do we do phonology in this? How do we do morphology in this? How do we talk about language variation? How do we talk language change? Um, how do we apply it to acquisition? All these things remain to be worked out. I'm only one guy. I hope I can persuade some other people to take on these problems rather than say, well, how do you do this, right? Uh, which gets annoying after a while because I don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's the end of the story for today. Thank you. do I still need an independent syntactic component? And the answer is, if I didn't need one, that would be great, right? And cognitive linguistics and lots of other schools of thought say, who needs grammar? Who needs syntax? And this is just the usual overreaction to uh, the standard claims, who needs anything else besides syntax, right? Um, sure, you still need syntax. You still need to know where the verb goes. You still need to know what agrees with what. You still need to know, uh, to the extent that there's syntactic conditions on, let's say, anaphora. You still need to know, does this language have indirect objects? There are all kinds of, you have to know, how does this language construct relative clauses? Or does it have the WH at the front, or here, or both, or, you know, all those things. And so you need a theory of, um, um, certainly, what the, what the possibilities are for syntax. Uh, I don't think you can do it in terms of parameters um, because there are too many weird variations. If you want to encompass all the syntactic knots, which cannot be parameterized. Um, I think Kalko was arguing is once you take care of the syntactic knots, have a learning period for that, why do you need a special learning period for uh, uh, the general parts of language? But you certainly need a learning period for syntax that's specific this, you know, Specific to syntax. No question. It doesn't go away. It's just simpler. Yeah, back there. I wonder if you could speculate on the, the quality of, of the memory. How does the lexicon get now? In, uh, okay, let me start again. Yeah. So if the thing <coughs> is traditionally called words and the things which you're now calling, say, treatment, are all sorted on lexicon, mm -hmm. what does the memory, what is the form of the memory structure of our lexicon look like? For example, why is it that words seem, is it just a trick of memory that words seem like something that you can access where tree lips don't seem to be so? 
Um, well, I'm just viewing the lexicon as pieces of stored linguistic structure. Um, to talk, so I think the reason I got into the consciousness game, I wrote a book on consciousness in you know, 87, is because it struck me that the only part of language that you really have any conscious access to is phonology. Um, so that sort of uh, comports with your uh, intuition, I think. Uh, and it explains a lot of things about why we experience our thought. When we're talking to ourselves, we're hearing it in our own language with stress, with uh, intonation, and so forth. Um, and it, I think, is very uh, creates a very serious problem for every major theory of consciousness on the market. Um, so that would be sort of my answer to you. I don't know if that's enough. The syntactic trees have no phonological uh, uh, content. So we don't access them. They do show up in syntactic priming very much, it turns out, very much the same way that words do. So the way syntactic structures prime subsequent usages seem, seems to be very, and that, that's a puzzle for rule-based grammars, you know, rule versus word-based grammar. But it's quite natural in this Although well, syntactic priming doesn't have the same kinds of qualities as uh, <coughs> Some of the same, yeah. Some of them, not all together, of course, but a lot of the same things. Yeah, yeah, uh, Charles. Something's called a parallel architecture. I find I'm completely confused about what you mean by parallel. So within modules and these phenomena of cross modules. Yeah. First, I thought there was this paradox because uh, yeah, Chomsky doesn't care about processing. He says, I don't care about context. Right, and then, but then he has this merge, which looks very procedural. Right, and you you say, oh, we, we care about processing and parsing, mm -hmm. and we don't do anything; we just have structure. Right. So then I, I was going to say, well, how do you, like, that seems like a paradox. But then you said unification can give you merge; it's basically more powerful yeah. than merge. Yeah. And so now it seems to me that if unification is parallel, then merge is parallel. So I don't understand the difference between any. Okay. Um, no, what I take to parallel is the multiple generative system. So that's the, that's the fundamental thought behind parallelism. You know, that it's not just one system generating everything. There are multiple systems that are creating independent structures, and then those are linked. So if okay. John, John said, well, I got merged in syntax, yeah. but then I also have to obey uh, phonological constraints. Then you would be agreeing to them? Um, well, if he thought the phonological constraints were independent and not just derivative, but he never says that. But you don't believe, you said there's yeah. um, language and vision. And you know, you can, we can talk about what we see, but yep. do you think that there's, for example, vision constraints in the visual system that affect how we speak as well? Um, there are certain constraints on the visual system. How would they affect how we speak? I mean, only insofar as, for example, um, to the extent that so there's other ways of interacting between modules. Yeah. Oh well. Let me go. Yeah. Let me go back to the constraint versus processing because here here's the relationship between the competence and performance model in the parallel architecture. The competence model says here are the possible pieces. Here are the pieces of structure. Here are the possible ways of putting them together. The performance model says here's how you do it in real time in a real human memory. Okay. So but the, those are exactly the pieces. It's making a, this, you know, a real concrete claim about what the pieces are. And that makes predictions about the time course of processing and stuff, which we're now beginning to figure out how to test. Um, where, so I can say that you know, we can still do concrete. What I'm going to say, the initial motivation, if you look back at the, the, the distinction between competence and performance, and you sort of read between the lines and aspects. Chomsky is really trying to say, we don't want to have to worry about how things are processed. We want to do what linguists always do. We want to look at forms and relationships and ungrammaticality, you know, and not have to worry about, uh, it's also quite off the behavior to say every cough is, has to be part of your theory of language. So we want to be able to idealize away from all that stuff. But the way he does it, as is typical of him, he says, this is a principal distinction that anybody rational would make. <laughs> okay? And, um, you know, some, and 
someday maybe we can see what the relationship is. And for a while it looked like it was good because there was this derivational theory of complexity. Then the derivational theory of complexity went down in flames, I think because of the wrong theory of linguistic structure and derivation. Um, and so they said, well, the transformational grammar is completely wrong. And Chomsky said, no, 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 no. It makes no claims about performance. Okay, I mean, that was the rhetorical move. So cut off the connection. Um, and I very anti -bio Yeah, which is very anti bio -linguistic. Yeah, so I think what he's trying to do now is to go straight to the biology. Not to biology, but to sort of mathematical principles of, bi of biology bypassing all the psychology, all the neuroscience. Um, so it's really, I find it kind of hollow for my own face. I mean, if you don't mind my being a little confrontation. <laughs> uh, yeah, now Steve is going to give me a hard time about that. No, no, no. no. <laughs> in your redistribution of the mold in this parallel way, yeah. what is the status of the property of the students? Exactly the same. It's exactly the same. I mean, how does the child... I, I actually have a stronger view than probably the stimulus. Um, namely, how could the child ever figure out whether the right theory is 1965 transformational grammar, the minimalist program, LFD, the parallel architecture, Roland reference grammar, word grammar, HBSG, the child doesn't have a clue what the right architecture is, then they'll never get it, right? I mean, we haven't gotten it all thousands of us over 50 years, so the child must know something. Um, and there, there is nothing in the stimulus that tells you the right architecture as we know it as linguists, right? So, so it's a very rational person. Yeah. Uh, as I can say, these are all location and variants theory that all are stuck on the public stimulus. And the question is, about yours, is, is it really less um, implausible in the, bi in the biological studies? Well, the thing is, it's not the case in the um, No one will say other theories which really are not substantively different. But this theory is substantively different. Because he has no account of lots and lots of phenomena that I can talk about quite easily. He's never provided one in you know, many years, despite many challenges, not just from me, but from lots of other people. Uh, he has no substantive theory of semantics. He says, oh yes, semantics is very important. And I'm, I've been talking about semantics for all these years. And when you pin them down, it's always noun phrases and verb phrases. So he has no theory of semantics. He has no theory of the lexicon. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of things he can account for that I can't account for either. But they're not locational. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that just sets me off because we're saying, you know. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's get to the real question. Yeah. Just let me say in a yeah. way. But is your version, whether it's locational variant or a reliable theory, mm -hmm. uh, does it uh, still have the implausible implications about what needs to be ignored? About that traditionally yeah. plausible. I think it's a little better. I mean, I'm trying to, you know, play the line as carefully as I can. On one hand, you have the constraint. We would like to say what had to evolve is as little as possible. On the other hand, it has to be enough to account for language, right? Um, in a sense, we cut back a number of the assumptions that syntax has to make while trying to preserve uh, plausibility in terms of coverage of the data. Um, semantics, a great deal of it has to be there anyway to account for chimps and babies. So I don't feel that's a price I have to talk about in terms of evolution. Phonology, uh, well, nobody talks much about evolution and phonology. It seems to me there's a major step you have to make in order to get uh, the assumption on the part of the child that this noise is going to be uh, uh, divided into discrete segments that form a structured space. Um, otherwise, you can't have words. And you need words in order to even get the language engine started. Um, so I think that uh, 
as to what parts you need to add to get syntax and the syntax semantics and syntax phonology interfaces, that's still, I think, there's a dialectic about it. And I think it's an interesting one. Um, I would, as I said, I, would, I hate it that we need this grammatical functions here. That's something that you'd say, why would evolution come up with that, right? But every damn theory of language has something that, that is a notational variant of it, okay, that has the same effects. So I have to say it's in there. Don't ask me how evolution got it yet. Let's come back in a few years when we talk more about evolution and cognition. And maybe we can answer it more intelligently. So I'm, I, I, I'm very sensitive to that issue, but I don't want to say this is implausible because I do have to answer to the facts of language in great detail and say these are things that we can deal with. My own sense is uh, there, there's been a lot of stuff about, oh, it's the same memory processes, there's recursion all over the place, so you don't need anything special for language. Um, and my sense is, yes, it's the same learning procedures, yes, it's the same combinatorial processes, yes, it's the same kind of memory. What's different is the elements of the structure and the particularities of the structure. So is it, you know, um, is it nouns and verbs or is it syllables and, uh, you know, feet or something like that? And how do those combine differently? Um, so what's particular to the language faculty is the kinds of structure it has, not the kinds of processing those structures undergo or the, maybe not even the learning procedures that are necessary for those structures. I'm not sure. Uh, so I'm trying to uh, 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 take account of all these commonalities that are turning up all over the place. Without, uh, but I, but there are things about language that are still unique to it, and I don't want to give this up. Yes. Here's a question of me here. Why does Kip the Bucket appear as Kip the Bucket, but not some crazy stuff that seems it's stored? Could be something other than the regular English. It could. Um, but it never does. Well, there are idioms that don't conform to English structure. Are right? ungrammatical? Yeah, by and by. Day in, day out. I mean, you know, there are some. Um, but I think it, you know, my sense is that we can learn a lot by comparing idioms and morphology. So in morphology, we find lots and lots of derived words that have regular affixes and regular order and mean something peculiar, okay? Um, or we find things that have regular affixes and regular order and have a root that doesn't exist independently, but it should according to the regular rule. Um, and that's like idioms with, you know, cranberry morphemes in that, um, but otherwise unexceptionable structure. And so, um, Again, it's easier to learn them if they're redundant with existing structure. So redundancy is playing a role in this. Historical sources are independent. I mean, idioms don't come out of nowhere. Somebody had to use some uh, literal expression and slang in them and caught on as an idiom. So we have sort of historical sources in our favor. And you know, we just keep looking for those things. I think it's they, they, there are a lot of factors and uh, the. Um, I know the standard argument is that well, idioms all have the same structure as ordinary phrases, and that has to be explained. Well, yeah, it does, but I don't think that should overwhelm everything else. Uh, that shouldn't be the primary factor. And, you know, there are many candidate hypotheses besides the ones that, well, they really are, uh, uh, you know, verbs in disguise or something. Yeah. Happen. Where do they happen? Okay, well, derivation, if they are regular, so English regular plurals, most of Turkish morphology, uh, a lot of Japanese morphology, that's just done the same way as verbs are connected with their objects. Okay? So regular agreement, it's just you build it online in working memory if you want to make it. Where doesn't make sense in terms of confidence, but where it makes sense in terms of long-term versus working memory. Again, it's a nice way. Regimenting the question. Syntax or mm -hmm. syntax or morphology. 
It's, well, I think, okay, I think morphology is a misnomer because morphology is also divided into morphophonology, how you pronounce it, allomorphy, and stuff like that. Morphosyntax, how it affects the syntactic category and what it has to attach to. Morphosemantics, what morphemes, affixal morphemes can mean, and it's a limited set of those. Um, and so what we're seeing is, this is the, the show of Williams argument, there is a cut, besides the cut this way, the three components, there's a cut this way, phrasal and uh, uh, morphological. Okay? Um, so there's actually six components, if you like. Okay? Um, and so um, regular morphology is in all three of the morphological components, but it's constructed online. Okay? So the affix is the lexical item. Irregular and semi-regular morphology has to be listed in the lexicon, right? You have to learn there is this word and here's what it means and so on. Um, so that's listed in the lexicon with all three parts. The next question, which I'm really trying to settle for myself now, is when there are sub-regularities in irregular morphology, what are those rules like? And how are they different from productive? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if that helps. Kind of. I mean, it's the, the, I think if you're used to the old system, thinking in terms of parallel architecture, you have to kind of turn your mind inside out, um, which is really hard. It took me several years to begin to think this way. But once you can think this way, it's incredibly good way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to ask uh, how do you do this kind of practice, yeah. but I didn't ask my question properly before. I asked you about order, and I didn't mean linear order, and then order of application of what we call order of application of synthetic operations, or hierarchy if you prefer. And how do you, so basically, not how do you deal with order in the sense of linear order, okay. but in the sense of order of application of syntactic operations, so or the hierarchical order that we see inside these chunks that can be words or it can be uh, bigger things. Okay, well, hierarchical structure is no problem. I mean, I think for granted that there's hierarchical structure. Most of the things that have been called linear order of application of rules um, now turn out to be just sort of hierarchical domains for applying constraints. I mean, I think that's true in all the constraint-based theories. I do have some questions, serious questions remaining um, that come from construction grants where they say there are all these elaborate constructions and they're not very good. Construction programs are not very good on how you compose constructions with each other, um, which is the equivalent of you know, you do the passive, and then you do the middle, and then you do the result of it. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand yet how constructions compose with one another. Um, and the place where it really comes into to, to play is in phonology, I think, where, you know, I hang around Morris Halley a lot, and he says, you know, the optimality theoretic people who are trying to do everything simultaneously still have a great deal of difficulty accounting for the things that we used to do with ordered rules. So I think there's still a serious question there that's maybe the prototype for the syntactic problems as well. And uh, connected to these, I, I wonder if maybe the, the further away that you can go, uh, it looks like the further away that you can go from, from this approach is probably now cartography. Uh, even if there is at least one way to understand cartography, uh, so the work that uh, like on the left, on the left periphery and on the uh, functional domain in the IP, there is at least one way to understand it as uh, looking at it as, so from, from on the one side it looks like syntax does everything in that model. So it looks mm -hmm. like it's really the further way that you can go yeah. from your system. But on the other side, you can look at it as just, uh, you can take the, the order of the hierarchy of functional projections mm -hmm. as just being uh, a reflect of, of semantics. And uh, uh, if at the beginning people like Chinko would take it to be just a syntactic thing, I think now they are moving toward uh, taking seriously uh, the option that it's just a matrix that gives you this order. And then uh, if you look at it like this, it looks like syntax is just an interface between, uh, between semantics and sound. 
and then how, how far would it be from okay. from your system? Oh, well, it would, okay. What it requires to say there's this whole sequence of functional projection is there are all these nodes that contribute nothing to phenology at all, right? You, if, in fact, uh, in my 1972 book, there was a chapter on adverbs, and I think Chico started with that. And what I showed there was that different kinds of adverbs, they're free in position, but they have to go in certain linear order. And so I phrased it in terms of scope depending on linear order, and Ching Wei sort of took that and various other people and said, well, we can do it even better, we can do it in a hierarchy. Um, but I don't think you're gaining anything. Um, in one case you say syntax, semantic scope, which you need to do inference or whatever, maps into syntactic hierarchy, which then gets completely flattened out in phenology and is uh, 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 inaudible. Uh, does no work in syntax per se, except to get these adverbs in the right order. The other version says the adverb scope maps directly into linear order, which maps directly into phenology. So you bypass, you get the same effects, same complexity in the mapping, but you need fewer nodes in the syntax. That's sort of how I would do it. So you still have constraints on linear order, but they're just constraints on linear order. If you're not following from syntactic hierarchy, um, I think that's the difference. And so actually, it's making the syntax more minimal in the sense that it needs fewer assumptions about the rule, about the uh, nodes. Does that help? Kind yeah, of? but it's, I don't know. It still looks to me that syntax doesn't have to be so heavy. If you map all these things, if you take syntax to be an interface, then reading uh, so on the phonological side, what you have is mm -hmm. easy because you always do the same thing. You always read yeah, on the same component instead of talking directly to your semantics. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah. Well, in this case, yeah, in this case, linear order, you don't even need any syntactic structure to from linear order to semantic. And in fact, in uh, my understanding of pigeons, that's how it works. You know, it doesn't work all the time, which is why, you know, the grammar with inflection and trees and stuff is dead. Uh, but it works pretty well for a lot of things. Um, so to the extent that you can keep things out of syntax altogether, so much the better. I'm going to drink. <laughs> <laughs>